It is therefore time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, one of these CEO salaries is not like the others. Manitoba Hydro, six, 466000 Saskatchewan Power, $481,000. BC Hydro, $489,000. Quebec Hydro, $543,000. Hydro One, $6.2 million. Wow. Mr. Speaker, wow. how does the Premier justify her $6 million man? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it is very important uh, that we acknowledge and recognize, Mr. Speaker, that executive salaries are high compared to the vast majority of Ontario salaries. And, Mr. Speaker, we remain committed to Hydro One's regulation, accountability, and transparency through our government's involvement as a majority shareholder. That said, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One is now a publicly traded company, not a government entity. And Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, also reports that 80 percent, 80 percent of the company's CEO compensation is paid out only if aggressive performance targets are met, targets that lead to more affordable bills for customers, Mr. Speaker. So since broadening ownership of Hydro One, the company's leadership has already made $114 million in savings for their customers, Mr. Speaker. These significant savings have been realized through enhancements Answer. To, to customer service, Mr. Speaker, and the company's commitment to lowering costs for the ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, back to the Premier. Last year was a windfall for Hydro One execs. The Millionaires Club is a sight to behold. The President and CEO, Mayor Schmidt, Mayo Schmidt, $6.2 million in speaker. That's after an increase just this year alone. The increase is $1.7 million. Wow. The former CFO, $1.2 million. The uh, senior vice president and acting CFO, just under a million. The COO made $2.1 million. Yeah. One executive vice president made $2 million and another $1.9 million. This, this is outrageous, Speaker. They all make more money than the CAOs of any other hydro company. Mr. Speaker, will the, while the average family struggles to make ends meet, how does the Premier justify paying her millionaire's club? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker. Once again, um, Hydro One's rates continue to be set by the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker. And when taking this into consideration, the board is the energy sector's independent regulator with a mandate to protect the province's electricity consumers, and it continues to deliver on its mandate. So, for instance, last fall, the board capped the portion of executive compensation at Hydro One um, for electricity customers, and they're required to fund that at 10 percent of base salaries, saving ratepayers $30 million over this year and next, Mr. Speaker. And we understand. We understand that affordability is critical for families and businesses, which is why we launched the Fair Hydro Plan, which reduced rates by 25 per cent on average for all residential customers and as many as a half a million small businesses and farms, Mr. Speaker. Once again, it is important to emphasize that this salary is only paid if aggressive performance targets are met, targets that lead to more affordable bills for ratepayers. Final supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. I can't believe, Speaker, that this government is defending this. The I Premier once said, quote, any decision of that magnitude were, would require a two-thirds majority of the Hydro One Board of Directors, which means that having 40 per cent ownership protects us. She added, with 40 per cent ownership of the board, that would require that the people of Ontario have a say. She went on one step further, Speaker, and said, quote, will there be the ability of the government to retain control over major decisions because of that 40 per cent ownership? Yes. So that means, Speaker, the Premier is responsible for these outrageous salaries. Mr. Speaker, how can the Premier be trusted when she is signing off on the $6 million salary? Here, here, here. Thank you. 
Minister. Once again, we recognize, Mr. Speaker, that these executive salaries are high compared to the vast majority of Ontario salaries, and we remain committed to Hydro One's regulation and accountability and transparency through our government's involvement as a majority shareholder, Mr. Speaker. But let's look at what the opposition is claiming. They're claiming that they're concerned about lowering electricity bills, but when it came for them to take action, Mr. Speaker, what did they do? They voted against the Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker, and now, because they don't support fighting climate climate change, they'll have to cut billions in programs that Ontarians count on every single day. They'll have to cut programs like free childcare, like OHIP Plus, like free tuition, or dental or prescription coverage, Mr. Speaker. Unlike their half-baked scheme, Ontarians know that we have a plan to increase fairness and create more opportunity, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to do that for the people of Ontario, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker. We'll continue to act to make sure that we've got their best interests at heart. Thank you. In this round of questions, you've uh, asked me to put warnings on, and I shall. We're in warnings. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The member from Mississauga Streetsville is proud of this government's debt. He specifically said, quote, we have tripled, referring to the debt, and we're proud of it. There you go. The people of Ontario want to know if the Premier shares these sentiments. Mr. Speaker, is the Premier proud that she has saddled our grandchildren with her debt? I think she wanted to it. Speaker, let me, uh, let me just talk about the, um, the plan that we have been implementing, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to, uh, we're going to continue to build on as we, uh, as we uh, brought our budget forward, Mr. Speaker. You know, what we know is that there are people across this province, whether it's a family with a teenager who's looking for mental health challenges, and I know that the uh, girls' government group is going to be talking about mental health today, Mr. Speaker, whether it's a young mom who can't can't find childcare, wants to get back into work, but can't find childcare that she can afford, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's someone working in a minimum wage job, Mr. Speaker, who today has more money in his pocket. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. Finish, please. Because the minimum wage is now $14 an hour and will go to $15 an hour. Those are the people who we are fighting for, Mr. Speaker. And that is the care that we know is needed in this province, and that is what we are proud of, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, uh, back to the Premier. What we do know is that this government has put our province's future in doubt, Speaker. Right. In no way, in no way at all, is tripling the debt a responsible thing to do. Ontario has the highest debt of any province or state on the entire planet, Speaker. This is crowding out the services we all depend on, like health care and education, which is why this Premier fired 1,600 nurses and closed 600 schools, Speaker, more than any other government in the history of our province. This debt is putting an unfair burden on our children and grandchildren. Mr. Speaker, the government's debt is the reason they cut services instead of caring about families. Here, here. You know, Mr. You Speaker, that. I know that the member opposite knows that we've built 800 schools. I know he yeah. knows that. Yeah. And he knows that we've renovated another 780. But, Mr. Speaker, the, the reality is that if we do not make these investments in people, then we will be in a situation where our economy will not continue to grow. We have balanced the budget this year, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We've made investments in infrastructure across the province, Mr. Speaker. And we know that at this moment, what is needed in Ontario is an investment in people. People, an investment in their care, an investment in giving them the tools so that they can care for themselves and they can care for their families. Mr. Speaker, the, the member opposite is standing up for a party that has promised that they will cut billions out of education, billions out of health care, and billions out of services to people in this province. Mr. Speaker, that's not our plan. You see it, please. You see it, please. A member from the P and Carlton is warned. 
And I do know that someone in a certain area did say something unparliamentary, but if I actually knew exactly who it was, I'd ask them to withdraw. I'm not playing. Final supplementary. Well, the people are disappointed that making up stories for political gain seems to be the new approach of the, of the uh, Premier Speaker. And quite frankly, we are shocked that this Premier is defending the member from Mississauga Streetsville. What else does she defend from this member? He has advocated for higher taxes on hardworking families. On his website, the member from Mississauga Streetsville called on the federal government to raise the GST by 1%. He wrote, quote, the feds should restore one percentage point of the GST removed during the previous decade, raising it to 6%. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier support the member's statement on new taxes as well? Is she going to be calling on Prime Minister Trudeau to raise the GST? Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I invite the member opposite to read our budget, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. I invite the member opposite to look at the policies that we're putting in place, Mr. Speaker. I invite the member opposite to talk to the people in his community who are looking for childcare, who are looking for mental health services, Mr. Speaker. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Finish, please. Who are working on minimum wage, Mr. Speaker? I invite the member opposite to talk to those people and ask them their thoughts on getting more support. Mr. Speaker, we know that this party is capable of cutting billions out of the public service, out of education, out of health care. They've done it before, Mr. Speaker, and they would do it again. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. The Minister of Children and Youth Services is warned. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Premier seems to think that children's dental care costs $50 a year because that's how much is in her Liberal budget uh, to look after kids' teeth. I haven't heard many dentist offices myself, Speaker, that will clean a child's teeth, do an x-ray, a checkup, maybe fill a cavity. For 50 bucks. If she has, I know a lot of parents will want that phone number. Does the Premier know any dentist who will actually look after a child's teeth for 50 bucks? And will she give out that telephone number to the parents of Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Speaker, I, you know, I, uh, I actually have no um, quarrel with the leader of the third party that there needs to be support for families in this province for dental care and, uh, and pharma care, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that. We put in place OHIP Plus. And, Mr. Speaker, for years we've been working on the Healthy Smiles program, on expanding it, Mr. Speaker. There are 450,000 kids who access uh, important dental services through the, uh, the Healthy Smiles program, Mr. Speaker. So this for us is not uh, this is not a new issue. This is something that we have been working on, that we recognize needs more work, Mr. Speaker. I'm very happy that the leader of the third party is now coming on, on side and is, uh, is concerned about this, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work with the dentists, with the community, to find ways of supporting. But this money that is in Answer. our budget, Mr. Speaker, will help families to access more support for their kids. Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Speaker, Hamilton's medical officer of health says that 42% of grade 2 students in Hamilton have tooth decay. 50 bucks per child won't fix that speaker and neither has this liberal government's healthy smiles program. Nope. Promising to send voters 50 a 50 dollar check isn't a dental plan speaker. It looks more like vote buying. The liberals have ignored people's The leader will withdraw. Withdraw speaker. Carry on. Promising to send voters a $50 check isn't a dental plan. The voters can decide for themselves exactly what it is. The Liberals have ignored people's dental care needs, Speaker, for 15 years. Is this Liberal Premier trying to get votes or trying to get kids to the dentist? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as I said, for, uh, for a number of years, we have been 
putting more supports in place for Healthy Smiles, all of which improvements the Leader uh, and her party have voted against. Mr. Speaker. Um, let's just be clear about what this program is. Uh, there would be reimbursements of up to a maximum of $400 per single person, Mr. Speaker, $600 per couple, and $700 for a family of four with two children. Mr. Speaker, I know that it is not all that is needed. I know that there's more that needs to be done, and we will continue to find ways to support folk, uh, families as they look for care for their kids. But, Mr. Speaker, we're also putting in place free preschool childcare. Mr. Speaker, yeah. we're expanding the free tuition program. Mr. Speaker, it is not in isolation that we were putting these uh, these programs in place. Mr. Speaker, we understand that people need support. Uh, putting some dental care and pharma care in place is part of that, but it's Answer. part of a much better, much bigger package of support that we recognize families need across the province. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the P Premier doesn't actually have a plan to ensure children in Ontario can see a dentist. That's obvious. Doug Ford and the Conservatives would be even worse, quite frankly. The solution to a bad choice isn't picking something worse, Speaker. New Democrats will ensure that every child in Ontario can see a dentist no matter where they live or how much money their parents earn. Why doesn't the Premier believe in universal access to dental care, Speaker? I believe in universal access. You know, the uh, the leader of the third party talks about universal access, and yet the the small plan for pharmacare that she put forward would only have covered 110 prescription medications, Mr. Speaker. Our program, which is universal for all children from their birth till their 25th birthday, and next year for seniors, will cover all 4,400 medications, That's Mr. Right. Speaker. So we come at this from a different angle, Mr. Speaker, but I believe that we both understand that were we to build a Medicare system today, pharmacare and dental care would be part of that, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, we can't roll the clock back to 1969, and so we are building in those supports. But do I believe that they need to be broader and they need to be national? Absolutely, Mr. Speaker, and I will continue to fight for that. Thank you. Good question. <clears throat> the leader of the third party. Speaker, my next question is to the Premier. Maybe she should roll the clock, clock back to 2003. They could have got started back then, Speaker. Perhaps we should have a Premier who understands what the word universality means. You know, last week I met uh, Gary in Oshawa, who told me about having to pull his own tooth, Speaker, his own tooth, because he couldn't afford the dental work. He has a hole in his mouth now and can only chew on the left side of his mouth. Worse than pulling his own tooth, was having to leave the dentist's office with his son, unable to afford the filling, and knowing that his child would have to wait months in pain until the, the, he could afford the dental filling. A delay that made the cavity worse, made the pain worse, and made the work more expensive. This should not be happening in Ontario. For 15 years, the Liberals didn't help Gary or his son or many, many families like them, and their dental scheme Question. still wouldn't. Why not? Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to comment, but Mr. Speaker, we have not waited until now to address this issue. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party would uh, would perpetuate that, but that is not true, Mr. Speaker. We have been building the Healthy Smiles program. We recognize that there is a huge challenge for families across the province. This budget introduces a benefit, a new uh, Ontario drug and dental plan program, Mr. Speaker. It will reimburse families up to seven hundred dollars for a, a family, a couple with uh, with two children, Mr. Speaker, and we've also committed to extending public dental programs to low-income adults by 2025. We recognize that there is a problem, Mr. Speaker. We have been working to solve it. We will continue to work to solve it. This is not a new issue, even though the leader of the third party has come to this uh, to this issue uh, of late, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we sir. have been working to find solutions. We've been working with the dental community. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Thank In you. the interim, we are putting this program in place. Supplement. Well, Speaker, I guess the Premier forgot about the other question when I talked about the 42 per cent of grade two students with dental decay. That shows you how ineffective their Healthy Smiles program has been, Speaker. Jordan DeTori is studying to be a social worker in Sarnia, and she wants to make Ontario a better place for people. She's lucky to have some dental coverage at school, but it's only $500 that she splits between her care and the care of her son. Last week, she found out that she's going to need $1,200 worth of work to fix an abscessed tooth. Even with her insurance and with the Premier's plan, 
Jordan would be out of pocket, and so she can't afford to get her abscess done. Jordan needs full dental coverage, Speaker. Jordan's son needs full dental coverage. Why doesn't the Premier get that? Long-term care. Long health, long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and certainly our government recognizes the importance of good oral health care for the people in this province, and that's precisely why we have, through the years that we've been in government, been expanding our programs in this regard. Uh, the Premier has mentioned the Healthy Smiles program. This has expanded coverage and now covers some 470,000 children across this province for important dental services. It includes free, preventive, routine and emergency dental services for children and youth from low-income households across wow, the great. province. And there is no limit to our funding for the Healthy Smiles program. We work with dentists to ensure that every single eligible child has the necessary services available. And of course, with our budget, we have extended this coverage to vulnerable people uh, in uh, a case where they do not have any extended health benefits themselves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final Speaker, I believe in universal health care. The Premier and her government have spent 15 years overcrowding hospitals. I believe in pharmacare for everyone. The Premier is picking and choosing who she thinks will help her win an election. I believe everyone should be able to see a dentist. The Premier wants to pay for only half of a child's filling. Why doesn't the Premier believe in health and dental care for everyone, Speaker? Thank you. Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, of course, we didn't pick and choose which drugs to cover in our OHIP Plus coverage. We coverage all the drugs under the uh, Ontario Drug yeah. Benefit Plan, those that are deemed eligible for that plan. And of course, we have been providing dental care in many different ways to vulnerable people in uh, Ontario. Our government does provide dental benefits for individuals receiving income support under the Ontario Disability Support Program. For those who are on Ontario Works, they also may receive dental coverage when in the need of emergency dental care or to help them get back on their feet and participate in employment assistance activities. We have taken many steps to improve dental care in this province, and our budget takes it to the next level. Mr. Speaker, people will be Answer. receiving up to 80 per cent of eligible uh, expenditures to a certain limit. It's an excellent Thank you. step forward. Thank you, Mr. New question. The member from uh, Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Liberal government just made a $31 million payout to the Terrell English Catholic Teachers Association Ooh. a month before the election. $31 million. Harvey Bischoff, president of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, described the settlement on Friday, quote, as a dirty deal that clearly wasn't done, dirt cheap. Sam Hammond, president of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, called the payment, quote, outrageous. Speaker, he went on to say, quote, is this a way for the Liberals to reward their political allies and retaliate against the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario and others for successfully challenging the government's violation of our charter rights? Speaker, does the Liberal government share Question. the concerns of Ontario's major teachers' unions? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to rise and, sp and speak about this uh, very important uh, issue and to sort of create some clarity about what's going on. First of all, Mr. Speaker, I want to make sure that the member opposite understands that this is something the Superior Court directed all parties to work together to reach a resolution on remedy, and so they directed all of us to do that, and I'm pleased to say we have reached agreements with the OSSTF, with OPSU, with QP, and with Unifor. In addition to this, this is about also mitigating further risks and further constitutional challenges. And so we are moving forward by ensuring, Mr. Speaker, that our school systems continue to run smoothly without disruptions. And so what we're doing is proactively moving forward with further uh, settlements and agreements with associations yes, to ensure that we are resolving any grievances that may be out there and ensuring that we are preparing for the future. I'm, I'm happy to answer. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Speaker, a $31 million payout a month 
before the election is rightly raising some eyebrows and concerns. Whether it's school closures, violence in the classrooms, or the mental health crisis in elementary and secondary schools, the Liberal government only seems to care about education when it helps their political self-interest. Speaker, is the Liberal government trying to buy support a month before the election? The member will withdraw. Draw, Speaker. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to point out that the Superior Court directed all parties to work together to reach a resolution on remedy. And so we have moved forward with agreements with the OSSTF, with OPSU, with QP, and with Unifor. And now we have ongoing discussions with five different groups. As you heard, we just settled with OECTA. We're also looking at five different other groups, including AFO, OCW, and principals, to just name a few. Why? Because we want to mitigate the risk of further constitutional challenges. Mr. Speaker, this is called doing our due diligence, ensuring that the school system is there, is strong, and is working for all parties and everyone there, so to ensure that our children do get the best quality education they can. The parties are at the various bargaining tables, had different priorities in their negotiations, and so it takes time to ensure that we are doing everything we can to reach agreements with all of these various pieces and all of these various associations, but we are doing our best to ensure that we are doing what needs to get done. Answer. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, ask any nurse, ask any healthcare professional, any physician, or any families who need health care, and they will tell you there is a crisis of hallway medicine and overcrowding inside Ontario's hospitals. Under this Premier's watch, hospitals have been forced to cut beds, cut nurses, cut care year after year, making wait time longer for people who need that care. But instead of fixing the problem with a plan to end hallway medicine and fund hospitals properly every year, the Premier is disappointing people once again. New Democrats have a plan to end hallway medicine. Why doesn't this government? Thank you. Minister of Health. Minister of Health. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, this is, uh, really goes to the heart of our budget proposals, uh, which I'm sure the member opposite is aware of. We have invested each and every year in our hospitals. And in this year, in particular, we ha are making, uh, if passed, if uh, the opposition parties might uh, actually read our budget and per perhaps pass it with us, uh, we are proposing an additional investment of $822 million for Ontario's public publicly funded hospitals. So this is a 4.6% overall increase. It will increase capacity, it will decrease wait times, and it will improve access to care for families across uh, Ontario. It means 26,000 additional MRI operating hours, 14,000 more surgical and medical procedures, and 3,000 more cardiac procedures, and of course in many other areas also, our capacity Answer. will be increased through this major investment. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. For four straight years, the Premier froze hospital budget, meaning deep cuts to the care yes. that people count on. Now, patients are being treated in hallways, emergency room wait time have hit record high, and hospitals from London to Toronto, Ottawa to Sudbury, Thunder Bay, and beyond are all dangerously overcrowded. But instead of fixing the problem, this Premier is leaving the hospital sector in the dark without a long-term plan to end hallway medicine once and for all. Why is this government letting people down and refusing to fix the crisis inside a hospital that this Liberal government cut created? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Speaker. Well, in the last week, I've had the opportunity to visit many hospitals across this province, and I have been hearing from hospital CEOs, from board members, what exactly our investment's going to mean, and they are receiving it extremely positively. And they know perfectly well that we have made investments each and every year of additional capacity to our hospitals. Last year, it was some $500 million to hospitals. And then, of course, in the fall, because of the poor uh, flu season, 
season and some particular circumstances. We added capacity across the continuum of care by adding 1,200 hospital beds and another 800 spaces in the community for patient care across the province. That was equivalent to six new medium-sized hospitals. And I'd be really curious to know if the third party's plan coming up when we finally Answer. hear it would again cut the 9,645 beds as they did in the past. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Your question, the member from Davenport. Speaker, my question this morning is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, Honest. libraries support children learn, provide resources for students and newcomers, and help small businesses and entrepreneurs. They play a valuable role in communities across the province, whether they are urban, rural or Indigenous, and I know how important the Perth DuPont, the Bloor Lansdowne and the Dufferin St. Clair Libraries are in my riding of Davenport. In 2016, 1,141 library service points across Ontario received over 71 million in-person visits, 104 million electronic and 26 million social media visits. Along with many Ontarians, I was thrilled to see in this year's budget additional funding allocated towards libraries across the province. This includes support for both operating and digital public library funding. Question. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you tell the members of this House more about how important libraries are in our communities? Minister of Tourism, Culture, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for Davenport for that important question. Speaker, under this government's culture strategy, we made a pledge to continue to support services like libraries that boost the quality of life in all our communities. More funding is going to ensure that libraries across the province can continue to respond to the needs of residents. Speaker, on this side of the House, we're always looking for ways to ensure that libraries have the supports in place that they need to thrive. By way of comparison, Speaker, the party opposite does not mention the word culture even once in its election platform. And more troubling, the leader of the opposition vowed to close libraries during his time as a Toronto councillor. He said that he would close a library in his writing in, quote, a heartbeat, and even went so far as to suggest that there are more libraries than Tim Hortons in his writing, which was yes, an sir. exaggeration that proved to be false. Speaker, our government remains committed to supporting essential hubs like libraries that do connect people. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for that response. Libraries are indeed the pillars of knowledge in our city's towns and local communities. Not only are they a resource to grab your favourite literary titles, but they are an integral tool when it comes to supporting our educational institutions. And as a mom of two young boys, I know firsthand how important libraries are to support school projects. The services that libraries provide, to, uh, to provide help to expand the knowledge and insight of the communities that they service and are meant to connect people to the resources in a way that is easily accessible and efficient. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the funding available to libraries announced in this year's budget? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. And I, too, as a mother of three, spent many hours in our local public library. Uh, speaker, the member noted that libraries are a vehicle to spread knowledge within our local communities, and that's why I'm proud to say that our government is making the most significant significant investment in public libraries in a generation. We are investing $79 million more into public libraries, including $51 million over three years in annual increases and $28 million over three years to launch a province-wide digital public library. This investment is going to help public libraries reduce costs of accessing digital content, such as e-books and films, and give public library users across Ontario access to digital content. And, Speaker, this is especially important in rural and remote areas. I want to thank Answer. the Ontario Library Association and the Federation of Ontario Public Libraries for their strong advocacy for public libraries right across thank the province you. of Ontario. Thank you. Question. Member from Lanark, Farm Athletics and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. Yesterday morning, the member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Westdale made a serious accusation. He accused Doug Ford, and I quote, deliberately breaking the law. It was then retweeted by former journalist turned liberal shill Ashley Chinati from the Premier's office. Not only is the accusation egregious and false, 
The law they are accusing the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of breaking does not even exist. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is quite literally false news. It is reprehensible, yet unsurprising, that a former minister of this government and the Premier's office would have such a distorted view of the laws in Ontario. Question. Will the acting Premier apologize on behalf of the Premier's office and the member for spreading such willful misrepresentations? Thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the member um, makes reference to a situation. I'm, I believe it's the fact that the opposition haven't really presented their plan, and they have a plan, but they haven't costed it. And what they have, they had a plan that they then threw away. And I think the real question that's being asked by the people of Ontario is, What's your plan? How is it going to be costed? And what are the effects going to have on the people of Ontario? What are the cuts that they're making? People want to know, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Again, back to the acting premier. Speaker, the member from Hamilton, from Ancaster, Dundas, made a false statement. Hey, there was no response. I asked for an apology. Now, maybe as a former minister and in that role, he became accustomed to engaging and spreading false news. However, the facts do matter, Speaker, and the facts clearly show that. Stop the clock. I, uh, I was lenient for a certain amount of time, but now you continue to repeat yourself on the premise of a falsehood. So would you please withdraw and stay away from it? Thank you. In a time when so much information we read on the internet must be questioned and researched, the Premier's office should not be engaging in those sorts of activities. It's unacceptable, it's inappropriate, and it's intolerable that the former minister is both ignorant of the laws and the facts. Mr. Speaker, I didn't hear an apology or an answer to my first question. Will this question. Liberal government apologize for spreading both. The member will withdraw. Withdraw. Thank you. The member opposite makes reference to the fact that their leader is making bumper sticker slogans and is not substantiating it with any real fact or determination. They had a plan. They costed the plan. We know the plan to put $16 billion in the red. Come forward and tell the people of Ontario what's in your plan. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. New question. The member from Temiskamy Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Donna Quay uh, gave me a call in my constituency office last week, and we've been dealing with Donna's issues since 2016. We wrote a letter to the previous minister. She has TM joint disorder, and that uh, has to do with the joint in your lower jaw. It's a really gray area between OHIP and dental care. This lady's been fighting this for 20 years. It's got to the point where she needs to have her joints replaced. But why she called is because not so much for herself, but for others, because if she could have had a dental care program, some of her problems would have been fixed. What is $400 going to do for Donna Quay? Thank you. Minister of Health, Health and Care. Well, certainly, Mr. Speaker, we understand that there are many dental conditions that can be uh, very troublesome. The one the member alluded to is temporomandibular joint pain, uh, and uh, I certainly, uh, uh, my heart goes out to the individual who is clearly suffering. And whatever my ministry can do uh, to assist in any way, uh, we'll certainly pursue. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, because we do recognize that dental care is extremely important. It's an important aspect of people's overall health, and that's precisely why in this budget 
We have made a proposal Answer. to improve coverage for those without a dental plan. There are other avenues for people to pursue, and uh, in this particular case, I will Thank certainly you. take this case back. Thank you. Thank you. New question. Member from Kingston in the Islands. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Sorry. Minister. Apologize. Apologize. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the answer, Minister, but that doesn't help people like Donna, who, if Donna had access to a dental program 15 years ago, she would still be a functioning part of this society. Instead of, if this is not for everyone, this might not be like totally disabling, but in this case, it was totally disabling. And coming from Northern Ontario, a lot of times you don't even qualify for Northern Health travel grants. So, you know, we need, people need dental coverage so their life isn't ruined. Why has this government refused to implement full dental coverage 15 years ago, and why does it continue to refuse to do so now? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I've been here for 10 years, and I don't remember the uh, third party ever raising this uh, issue over those years until extremely recently. And of course, precisely this is why we have introduced our new Ontario Drug and Dental Program. I'm hoping the parties opposite will support it, because we are taking the next step to ensure everyone in Ontario has access to the health that they need. So no matter how old they are, what they do for a living, or even where they live, obviously we care deeply about the health status of Northern Ontarians. And this is our part of our plan to support care and opportunity and make life more affordable uh, for Ontarians. And so, as the member opposite is very clear, I'm sure we are offering the $400 for a single individual, $600 for a couple, Answer. and $750 for a family of four. This is an excellent step forward. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. I apologize uh, to the member from Tomiskamy Cochrane for missing his rotation. New question, member from Kingston in the Arms. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. This year's budget outlined a bold, progressive plan for care and opportunity in Ontario. It includes investments in the services people need and deserve, like pharmacare, childcare, and mental health. But it also includes historic investments in the infrastructure that people need to live the best lives possible and fully participate in our economy, no matter what part of Ontario they call home. I'm particularly excited about the government's latest commitment to broadband infrastructure, which was featured in our budget. Providing access to fast, reliable internet isn't just good for the economy, it enhances the quality of life. It means students can complete their homework online, small businesses can make their goods to, available to a wider audience, and people can connect with loved ones Question. in distant communities. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us about the broadband investment announced in the budget? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, thanks to the member from Kingston and the Islands for the question. Speaker, infrastructure is much more than bricks and mortar. It is also fiber optic cable connecting our rural and northern communities to high-speed internet. To participate in the changing global economy, Speaker, people need fast, reliable internet as an essential service. That is why our government has already invested $530 million in digital infrastructure since 2007. And this includes $90 million for the Southwest, over $62 million for Northern First Nation communities, and $130 million for R&D for new 5G networking. On top of that, Speaker, our budget includes an additional $500 million for improved broadband, bringing our total commitment to over $1 billion. Answer. Speaker, if the Conservatives actually care for rural and Northern Ontario, they will vote for these budget measures. Thank you. Supplementary. The minister for sharing some of the details on these essential investments. These projects referenced by the Minister of Infrastructure highlight the importance of expanding broadband in Ontario and will further complement previous investments in broadband made by this government. I'm excited to hear that these projects have a particular focus on improving access to those living and working in rural, northern and indigenous communities in Ontario. 
in addition to allowing rural Ontarians to fully participate in the 21st century economy and access these basic services, accessible and affordable broadband is essential to the work that they do. Mr. Speaker, as you know, fast and reliable broadband access is a key ingredient to unlocking enormous economic potential in our rural communities. Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, Monsieur Président, can the minister Please tell us about how broadband investments benefit rural Ontario. Question. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister of Agriculture, <laughs> Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very Small much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate uh, the investment. It will certainly help uh, the wonderful residents of Kingston and the islands. It helps families uh, to stay in touch, connect small businesses, connect the world, and allows the rural communities to participate and compete in this economy. Our government is very serious about getting Ontarians connected. That's why we're putting uh, $71 million towards a, a $200 million dollar expansion, broadband expansion, wow. particularly to my good friends that run the Eastern Ontario Regional Network. Projects like these, of course, are going to help businesses. Uh, just last week, along with my colleague, the Honourable Stephen Del Duca, we were at the Canada Candy uh, operation in beautiful Coburg, Ontario. At the same time, we, today we announced announcements that our Manda Tools at Maripasa Dairy in the city of Kawartha Lakes. Access to broadband has the potential to create and retain high-skilled jobs, increase productivity, Answer. and promote innovation. It's necessary for all industries to grow in the province of Ontario. This is important corporate investment, not corporate welfare, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Very good. Good question. The member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the uh, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Last spring, I introduced a private member's bill, the Ray and Walter Act. It's named in honour of two North Perth Fire Service members, Ken Ray and Ray Walter, who died battling a fire in March of 2011. The bill would require buildings with truss and lightweight construction to display a decal, a decal <coughs> that alerts firefighters ahead of time. This information is absolutely essential. The Ray and Walter Act passed unanimous, unanimously at second reading, but the bill died when this government, for political reasons, decided to prorogue the legislature. To the minister, now that I've mentioned the Ray and Walter Act, will she agree to fast track it? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for the uh, question and to the uh, for the advocacy on this issue uh, for the member opposite. We had a conversation actually when uh, he introduced uh, this private member's bill, and certainly as a as a member, he is uh, always welcome to reintroduce that bill again in this session, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. You know, the safety of all of our first responders, our firefighters, is uh, paramount. And when I look at you know each issues that I have arise over uh, the years at inquest uh, we have moved forward on on uh creating a fire uh, table, an expert a fire table, that actually have reviewed uh, the private member's bill um, at that table, because what we want is to create a safer Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And certainly for us, moving forward is definitely to continue Answer. to work for that safety. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. <clears throat> Back to the Minister, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, the Ray and Waller Act responds to a real gap in firefighter safety. It could save lives as soon as it's passed. I was grateful for the strong support I received from local fire chiefs, the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs, and from all parties in this legislature. I know the government recently issued a bunch of regulatory changes under the Fire Protection and Prevention Act, but they ignored the obvious, trust and lightweight identification. It's time to take action. If the government doesn't agree, why did they support the Ray and Waller Act at second reading? And when will they finally act on it? Thank you, Minister. So, so again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I very much uh, appreciate the question, and certainly, uh, I know that many members uh, in this house uh, have worked hard. And I was uh, a member once that brought forward private members' bill. Uh, certainly, it is our hope uh, 
uh, that their work will not be lost, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have proposed a comprehensive deal uh, with the opposition party to carry over all private members' bill. But under the new management, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Conservative have actually refused this agreement, and I want to share that in the House, Mr. Speaker, because certainly that means that only the only way that those bills can go forward uh, is for them to be reintroduced. So certainly, if a deal could have been reached, Mr. Speaker, we value Answer. all of the efforts of our members to introduce. So again, I'm very sorry that a Thank deal you. could not be reached under your new leadership. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. In March, the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority illegally approved a massive development that would pave over the Paradise Beach, Island Grove, provincially significant wetland. I say illegally because this development clearly violates the provincial policy statement, which strictly prohibits such developments. Will the Premier direct this rogue conservation authority to follow the law stop this development and prevent the loss of this provincially significant wetland. Thank you. Acting Premier. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Indeed, I think uh, while the ministry is, administers the Conservation Authorities Act and its regulation, it does not really oversee the operational decisions of a conservation authority. However, we are looking into uh, this particular file to see whether there are any things that, uh, that, was, uh, that has not been done properly. So no approval or permit are required from MNRF from the ministry at this, for this proposal. We've already ascertained that. And uh, we know that the Conservation Authority uh, regulates wetlands under their development interference with wetlands and the regulation that's appropriate. So we are actually looking whether there are uh, things that can be done to, uh, to see what has happened here. But up to now, we know that it's not, we cannot interfere Answer. in operational, de uh, uh, operational decisions of the uh, Conservation Authority. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. This isn't the first time that a rogue conservation authority has run roughshod over the province's laws to protect wetlands and natural heritage. My friend, the member for Welland, has warned about how the Niagara Region Conservation Authority appears to have been captured by private interests. The NDP tabled amendments to fix this problem when the government updated the Conservation Authorities Act. The government members voted those amendments down. Oh. Why is the Premier allowing conservation authorities and developers to ignore her government's own laws to protect wetlands and natural heritage? Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Obviously, we're continuing to look at what are the avenues possible, but as of now, we have ascertained that there are it's an operational decisions that they have made, and that we are continuing to look as, as to see what are the possible uh, appeals that can be taken from that decision. So that's where we are as, as of now. Certainly, I think wetlands protection are immensely uh, important for this government. We've continued to, uh, to put forward a really strong protections for wetlands. That's what allows us to continue to preserve the natural heritage, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for early years and child care. Now, Speaker, I am very proud that our government is committed to ensuring families have access to quality and affordable child care all across our province. And our government has taken and been a proud champion for Ontario families, taking strong action to transform the way child care is delivered in our province. In my riding of Beaches, East York, I represent a diverse range of people, including a large number who identify as First Nations and Métis. Speaker, as you know, the parties opposite have yet to mention anything in their platforms about child care for those living on unreserved communities. But creating cultural, diverse, and relevant child care in early learning spaces positively impacts our youngest learner's sense of self, and it will lead to better outcomes. Question. So, Speaker, will the minister responsible for early years in child care tell us what this government has been doing to meet the needs of Indigenous families and children living on reserve? Minister of Education, Minister responsible for child care in your early years. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Beaches East York for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, Ontario recognizes the value of culturally appropriate early years and childcare programs in First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities. In fact, our government is committed to working closely with Indigenous partners to support a strong early years and childcare system for these communities. In our recent budget, Mr. Speaker, we announced an investment of $40 million over three years to support the expansion of licensed childcare in First Nations communities. I think it's amazing news. This funding will help build valuable supports for young First Nations kids to help them get a strong start in life. In addition, new capital funding will also be available Answer. to First Nations to support the construction or retrofit of new and existing childcare facilities. This will help create valuable thank spaces. You. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the Minister for her response and that a great announcement and the amazing transformational work that she is doing to reform daycare in the province. Speaker, and I know that Indigenous youth are among the fastest growing population groups in Ontario and that they face significant outcome and achievement gaps. And this commitment of over $40 million towards childcare, improving this childcare on, on reserves, is a very significant program for children, families and communities. Childcare is an integral part of parents' economic empowerment, and research shows that children benefit significantly from access to high-quality childcare, including improved education, health and employment outcomes. So, Speaker, can the minister please tell us about the, how much more our government has been doing and the kind of incredible transformational work that we have been doing Question. with Indigenous partners to support a better, brighter, and more prosperous future for our Indigenous youth? Thank, Thank you. you. Minister. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this is a landmark commitment to expanding and improving child care on reserve. It's another demonstration of our government's commitment to help Indigenous children and youth grow up healthy and reach their full potential. Our uh, Reconciliation Action Plan, The Journey Together, provides $250 million towards initiatives including recreation based on life promotion programming for Indigenous uh, youth and other anti-racism projects. Our $45 million OSAP overhaul, and this is very important, has driven up a 35 per cent increase wow. in Indigenous people receiving OSAP grants. Those people are now off to colleges and universities and can look forward to rewarding lives in this province. And through our $222 million First Nations Health Action Plan, we are improving food security and mental health for Indigenous youth. Speaker, it's a shame that when I stand, you sit. New question. The member from Niagara West Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Families in my riding of Niagara West Glanbrook are horrified by the hallway medicine of this government. After 15 years, families face longer wait times, more service cuts, and less frontline workers. I recently heard from Lane and Melissa Tattison of Smithville. Their family has been plunged into a very dark time since September when their son was diagnosed with pandas. Melissa says, we have essentially been denied treatment in Ontario, despite living adjacent to one of the largest city centres in Canada, and have been forced to fly out of province to Alberta to access treatment. Why is this government showing this lack of care to Lane, Melissa, and their six sons? Thank you. Acting Premier. Minister of Health. Long-term care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly would like to hear directly from the member opposite about this particular case, uh, because uh, in some cases there are potential uh, solutions, and of course we, our heart goes out to this family that's having uh, some difficulty. Uh, but uh, this is precisely why, Mr. Speaker, we have made the deliberate choice to continue to invest in care for the people of Ontario. And so we're investing more in health care, in hospitals in particular. Uh, having visited a number in the last uh, week or so um, and seeing the improvements that we're making, uh, the reduction in wait times that people are facing, I'm really encouraged that our investment is exactly what we need to do. And of course, hospitals are just one part of the entire uh, puzzle. Answer. We need more home care, mental health care, long term care, all part of our health care system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. 
My question is back to the Acting Premier. I also spoke recently with Dr. Julian Owen, a physician from Grimsby, and he said that he and his colleagues are frustrated with this Liberal government's approach to health care. He and physicians across the province feel like they are being treated unfairly. Throwing money at the problem doesn't work when the government has created 15 years of structural issues. Julian said frontline care providers don't actually feel like their voices are heard. We aren't being listened to, and we can't trust any of the Liberals' promises. Speaker, why won't the Liberals actually listen to doctors like Julian and stop forcing them to practice hallway medicine? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm surprised that the member opposite from that particular riding is raising the question of his local hospital. I understand that the Harris government was prepared to close that hospital. Oh. Okay. And uh, so, of course, I'm really pleased that our government has continued to invest in uh, health care across the spectrum. And of course, we value our health care professionals, including our physicians, but also all those hardworking nurses, uh, the personal support workers. Each and every one of our health care professionals is. Con the member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. Wrap up sentence, please. So this is precisely why we're increasing our health care spending by 5 per cent to improve the capacity of our world-class health care system. Thank you. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. Across this province, people are struggling to make ends meet. Some are forced to take on debt just to feed their families and keep a roof over their heads. This is where predatory payday loan stores find them and often take advantage. In some cases, these outlets charge annual fees of 390 per cent on loans. Despite repeatedly asking this government to intervene, they've done very little to address this issue. Cities like Toronto, Hamilton, Ottawa are trying to curb payday lenders because they know that they prey on people who are experiencing hard times. Since this government inaction is forcing cities to protect their residents themselves, payday lenders, why won't this government just step up and protect all Ontarians? Premier. Minister of Government and Consumer Services, Mr. Speaker. Minister thank of you. Government and Consumer thank Services. You, and thanks uh, to the member for the question. And he'll know that Bill 59, putting Consumers First Act 2017, uh, amends a number of provincial statutes relating to alternative financial services. And uh, it's all about protecting consumers, uh, Speaker, who use uh, payday loans, alternative uh, financial services. And through these amendments, we've made the rules stronger, we've reduced risk for consumers accessing these services, and we've reduced the cost of borrowing, Speaker. The ministry consulted heavily with stakeholders, um, all kinds of groups that help inform the current direction we've taken. Uh, the regulations have been consulted on as well, Speaker, and new rules come into force July this year. So we're very happy that we've taken this action to protect consumers and respect businesses Answer. in our communities as well. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Lanark, Front, Atlantic, and Addington has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Acting Premier concerning incorrect news. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Perth, Wellington has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services concerning Ray and Walters Act. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. Tomorrow at 6 p.m. The member from Beaches East York on a point of order. Well, thank you, Speaker. It's come to my attention that the Speaker of this House celebrated a birthday on Saturday. I'd like us all to wish him a happy birthday. <laughs> The Speaker of this House uh, loves to be reminded of how old he is. There are no deferred votes. This House stays recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.